to present a number of very interesting international developments in osteopathic medicine, particularly in relation to osteopathy in the cranial field. Before we begin with these topics, however, I very much wish to stop and pay tribute to your American military ancestors who came to Europe to support and save us during World War II. The Belgian city of Bastogne was, in fact, where General Patton famously responded nuts to the Nazis' demand for surrender. I am inexpressibly grateful for the sacrifices that they and all Americans made for us and our neighboring nations within this shattering conflict. Please, let us offer a few moments of silence for their nobility and sacrifice. Thank you. Let us now move on to a presentation of some examples of international medical cooperation that have been evolving for decades and never more so than now. So let us do a cruise together to cross the ocean and discover in Europe the journey of the international deal. Before continuing, I'd like to apologize in advance for any English mistakes I might make. I even started taking intense advanced English courses last year to help ensure that everyone would be able to understand me. <laughs> Following are some highlights from my journey toward becoming an osteopathic practitioner. These are relevant to today's discussion as my career path, apart from my collaboration with the SCTF and the OCA, reflects that of many practitioners outside the United States who decided to change their approach and become osteopaths or osteopathic physicians. The decision in almost all instances was based on dissatisfaction with the results we were obtaining in our usual practice. We came to discover that a much different approach to health, that's non-invasive treatment, as a level of cause, rather than symptom by symptom, along with the greatest respect for the body's natural healing forces, was a far more effective approach than the ones we had previously been practicing. Unfortunately, this is also the path less taken, at least currently. The clear benefits of holistic therapies are largely not well known, or even more egregiously simply ignored by adherents of typical Western medicine. It is for, furthermore, as we see practically every day, normal for MDs to be hyper-specialized and to treat the body in slices. It is most disturbing for an osteopath to encounter an MD who practices urology, gynecology, or gastroenterology, yet has never heard of a dermatome or the reflex projection of a functional disease. In many cases, the first mode of treatment by such practitioners is, as a matter of course, drugs or surgery, instead of activation of the immune system and thereby the natural forces of healing. Fortunately, however, some MDs have become more attentive based on the clear success of osteopathic methods and are therefore coming to accept our competencies. These observations have indeed also led a number of international MDs to train as osteopathic physicians themselves. It is described, I would now like to return to the subject of the typical international path to osteopathy, which was also my own. I was born in Belgium 70 years ago. I attended both grade school and high school in Brussels and continued 
on to earn a teaching diploma at age 20. Like many young people, however, I then decided to take a completely different direction. So four years later, in 1970, I completed my degree in physical therapy at the Institut Supérieur de Kinesiotherapie in Brussels. I should mention here that I did all of my studies in physical therapy along with my fiancée, Annie, and that as soon as we received our recognitions as physical therapists from the Belgian National Health Service, we were made it. We have now been together for 50 years and married for 46 of those. We have one son, Mirko, one daughter, Magali, and four beautiful grandchildren. So as you can see, our academic collaboration was also the friendliest <laughs> Back in 1970, all Belgian men had to do one year of compulsory military service. For my service, I joined Belgium's famous military <coughs> hospital in Brussels, where I met and treated a great number of injured men. These men had not been wounded in battle, but were the victims of dangerous army training maneuvers that resulted at times in serious injury. This experience gave me enormous, enormous empathy for these young soldiers and officers, some of whom would be disabled for life due to their injuries. Unfortunately, like, so, like, like many so-called excellent physiotherapists who believe in what they have been taught, and that their techniques will be effective for any type of injury. When I applied my techniques with these men, I instead discovered the limits of the treatments I could offer. At the end of my military service, I began private physical therapy practice in collaboration with the Hospital of Brendan Waterloo, where the hospital surgeons referred their worst trauma and orthopedic cases to me for rehabilitation. It was exciting and rewarding to help treat broken legs and bodies, but for many specific injuries and functional troubles, I was unsatisfied with my results. I then began to seek out specialized training and postgraduate courses in physical therapy, believing that the solution was to further improve my existing set of skills. Very fortunately, however, around this time, I met up with some Belgian colleagues who had just entered the European School of Osteopathy in Maidstone, which is in the UK near London. Based on their experiences, I immediately began researching both osteopathy and the program offered by the ESO, and was most intrigued and impressed by what I discovered. I applied to the program and was accepted for the following year. Before speaking about the ESO, however, I'd like to take a few moments to give a little history about the arrival of osteopathy in the UK and indeed throughout Europe. The story began with John Martin Littlejohn, an anatomist and physiologist with the University of Glasgow. He left Scotland to enroll at Columbia University in New York where he completed a PhD in 1894. He was in poor health, however, and so he decided in 1897 to seek treatment from a celebrated and revolutionary MD in Kirkfield, Missouri, and that was Dr. A.T. Steele. He was so impressed with the resulting improvements that he decided to enroll in Dr. Steele's newly formed American School of Osteopathy. He completed his studies in 1900 in the same class as William Garland, Garner Sutherland, after which he moved to Chicago to create the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. He returned to Great Britain in 1913 and established in London the British School of Osteopathy, that's the BSO, in 1917. So in the 1920s, the osteopaths practicing in the UK comprised the DOs trained in the USA, DOs trained as a BSO, 
and even some practitioners who were trained via apprenticeship with established osteopaths. And now we can, we can move on to the establishment of the European School of Osteopathy. This school was created, founded in Paris in 1951 by Paul Genie, a French PT and acupuncturist at the École Française d'Osteopathie. However, as at that time osteopathy was illegal in France, Mr. Jenny moved the facility to London in 1965, where it existed for several years as a part-time school for physical therapists who wished to study osteopathy. Then, in 1971, the school moved to its final location in Maidstone, Kent, and was rechristened the Ecole Européenne d'Osteopathie. Following this, in 1974, the Ecole underwent a final name change. It became the European School of Osteopathy and began offering a full-time four-year program leading to a professional diploma in osteopathy. Then, 19 years later, in 1993, the school became accredited by the University of Wales to grant the Bachelor of Science in Osteopathy. This was followed shortly after by the accreditation of the Master of Science in Osteopathy by the University of Greenwich in 1994, and then finally in 1999, the ESO launched its internationally recognized PhD program. My best friend Pierre Duby, who is here today, was one of the colleagues who inspired me to study osteopathy and was a year ahead of, of me at the ESO. He earned his DO there in 1978 and I completed mine in 1979 at the symbolic age of 33. I'd like to take a moment sorry, to clarify why 33 is particularly symbolic in this context. First of all, human beings have 33 spinal vertebrae. It's important, right? Furthermore, in French-speaking countries, when you examine a patient's respiration, you ask him to say 33. That's 33 in French. The number 33 also has some three mystical associations. For example, Jesus of Nazareth is believed to have died at the age of 33. There are furthermore 23 progressive degrees in the ancient brotherhood known as Freemasonry, which promotes ethical and charitable actions in behalf of all humankind. In fact, as you may already know, our Lord, old Dr. A.T. Still, was a Freemason, as were many other highly accomplished Americans, including U.S. President George Washington and Franklin Delano. Roosevelt. But let us return to the earthly realm. As I promised myself I do upon completion of my training at the ESO, I stopped my physical therapy practice after graduation to become a full-time DO. I was ready to explain and implement the philosophy of Dr. S.T. Steele and its holistic approach to health, though I had not yet been exposed to and thereby was not yet practicing William Garner Sutton's principles of OCF. The professional risks of making the transition from physical therapist to DO were enormous. I had been working as a paramedical practitioner for nine years, accepting patients referred to me upon prescription from MDs, and this change in my status from PT providing physical treatments to frontline osteopathic practitioner would inevitably cause the loss of many contacts. It's interesting to note at this point that a few rare chiropractors were also practicing discreetly in Belgium at this time, and that they were known, like us, as specialists in approaches to the spine. Belgian law was, and still is, very strict concerning the practice of vertebral manipulation. So no one spoke of either chiropractic 
or osteopathy by name. We instead referred to both practices as manual manipulative therapy. However, shortly after this, in 1980, our newly formed Belgian Society of Osteopathy and Research in Manual Therapies, known also as the SBORTM, very proudly organized and hosted the first International Congress of Osteopathy in Brussels. In attendance were a number of prominent British DOs and American osteopathic physicians, including Gary Ostro, John Uppelger, Fred Mitchell Jr., and Lawrence Jones. This was the first step toward open acknowledgement of osteopathy in Belgium, and was therefore a risky one. In spite of this, however, the success of the Congress surpassed our loftiest expectations. Irritated by the flagrancy of this Congress, a number of MDs throughout Belgium began bringing complaints against osteopaths, citing the illegal practice of medicine in their lawsuits. They were able to do this because in Belgium, at that time, only MDs were legally authorized to practice manual manipulative medicine. Wow. Yet they were completely untrained in its techniques. As a result, we members of the Belgian Society of Osteopathy and research in manual therapy received notice to appear before the very official auto de médecin, the equivalent of the American Medical Association here in the United States, to respond to these accusations. Three of us young practitioners, Jean Burnot, Pierre Correa, and I, attended this convocation and faced a very severe and official team of all doctors, that's to say MDs, who, to be frank, seem, seemed simply to be jealous of our successful results and to not want the competition, regardless of how beneficial our approach was for patients. They demanded to know just who we thought we were and why we believed to be allowed to continue our illegal activities. As very enthusiastic and fearless young practitioners, we were more than ready to argue against such ridiculous rules. We were bold enough to ask this panel of MDs, is I found it logical that a physician who has received absolutely no, tra no training to perform medical manipulations should possess the legal right to offer two forms of treatment, while a DO, that's a former PT with a four-year master's degree in physical therapy and five additional years training as a practitioner of osteopathy does not. Their reaction, as might have been expected, was silence and suspicion. <laughs> we then pointed out that in the United Kingdom, where we had earned our DO degrees, osteopaths are fully accepted and recognized. This allayed the MDs doubt somewhat but still the laws didn't change. So we continued as before, working openly, yet illegally, and of course paying taxes on our earnings all the while, <laughs> which is still the case in many countries. A short while after this confrontation, one of my best friends, Edouard Duck, a DO from Namur, was sued by yet another local MD in an enormous show of solidarity Professor Pierre Cornio, MD, PhD, who was dean at that time of the Faculty of Medicine of the University of North Paris, came to Belgium and intervened in Edouard's behalf. He presented Belgian court officials with the paradox that Belgian DOs were constantly crossing the nearby border into France to teach osteopathy to French MDs at the University of North Paris, yet these same DOs were not officially recognized in their own country. After a long legal battle and in a heartening display of changing attitudes, the final result of this lawsuit was a symbolic fine of one Belgian franc. That's less than two US cents. And now let's turn to the topic of our speciality within osteopathy, the rightfully celebrated osteopathy in the cranial field. 
I would first like to relate with the utmost respect that in June 1939, that's just before my class graduation from the ESO, John Uppleger visited the school to present an introduction to cranial osteopathy. This was our, our first exposure to the relation of cerebrospinal fluid to the primary respiratory mechanism, and we were all very impressed by John's explanations. We were furthermore fortunate enough to be able to, be able to attend the five day course that, led, that John led that following summer in the south of the French city of Nice. I am aware that later on, John was declared a renegade based on what were perceived as commercial interests and accused of promoting his cranial sacral therapy through unqualified practitioners. This does not, however, diminish the fact that it was he who opened our eyes to another vision of osteopathy. Who opened it, oh sorry, and that he was the one responsible for our desire to pursue much more extensive and frequent contact with American leaders in the practice of OCF. In October 1980, I completed my first SCTF basic course, which was organized by the British School of Osteopathy in London. Our beloved Anne Wales, along with Colin Dove, Jack Duval, and my brother in spirit, Herbert Miller, were among the superbly talented faculty for this course. I'm sorry. Obviously, the course was wonderful and far superior to anything we were exposed to in Mainstone or Nice. But seriously, what followed was the unquenchable desire to continue these relationships, which is why since that time I never stopped crossing the Atlantic to become acquainted and reacquainted with the leaders, mentors, and champions of OCF. I recall very well my first contact with Roland Baker in 1983 during my second ACTF basic course in Colorado Springs. I knew I was meeting the Pope of OCF. <laughs> so I was most surprised when he introduced himself like this during the lab session. Hi Daniel, I am Rolling. let me help you. It was fortunate that I had no idea at the time how rarely he spoke to course participants, otherwise I might have reacted to giddily to make a decent impression. <laughs> Another very important first meeting took place at that time in Colorado. I had the honor of meeting Dr. Didier Fentes, a French MD who was also a physical therapist and DO. He asked if I could come to Paris to the Faculty of Medicine in Bobigny to teach OCF to MDs who wanted to become osteopathic physicians. The program began in 1983 and lectures took place one week and per month over a period of three years. Then in 1984, three of us Belgian osteopaths were selected first as table trainers for GOT and later as lecturers. Pierre Duby, Jean Bernard, taught biomechanics, and I, as the pioneer of OCF, was given in 1985 the responsibility of presenting a full overview of Dr. Sutherland's life and teachings. We conducted these courses for 10 years until so of our grad newly graduated students in osteopathy, who, as they had come up through the French system, were also at these, decided that non-physician DOs were no longer adequately qualified to continue training MDs in osteopathy. When it existed, this excellent program was called the DUMENAT, that's the Diplôme Universitaire en Médecine Naturelle Section Osteopathie. One of the finest students I taught was Dr. Maurice Mensoussan, a very skilled stomatologist who quickly became Brian Dio, and later, as you know, the first international FCA. Concerning Maurice, it is essential to mention that five years ago, while he was serving as president of the AMOC, Academy Medical d'Osteopathie Cranienne, he officially opened the doors of the Paris introductory cranial course of the OCA to French non-physician osteopaths. This step 
represented the end in France of a significant type of discriminations against NPDOs, non fission DOs. The only restriction, a reasonable one, is that participants must belong to an official French recognized affiliate society for osteopathic practitioners. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Maurice. John Haraka, as then president of the SCTF, became yet another excellent contact. I met John during my third SCTF basic course in Fort Worth, Texas, in 1984. The huge campus of the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine, the famous speaker, made me so excited and proud to be a part of that group. The basic course was excellent and was proof once again that it was all that it's always better to attend two or more basic courses to ensure optimal progress. Anyway, in addition to this, the excellent course content, John organized for us at his home an incredible Texas beer tasting that we will certainly never forget. <coughs> that same year, the Belgian Society of Osteopathy organized a second successful international congress followed by a wonderful STTF credit course. In celebration of this event, I invited some of the celebrities of the board to my home in land near Waterloo, where I still live, for a special Belgian beer and chocolate tasting. <laughs> Among these VIPs were Anne Wales, Herb Miller, Richard Feely, Lauren Dick, and Fred Mitchell Jr. Fred, at the time, after a lot of beers, script that due to its name, the famous Belgian beer, Quack, should be the official beer of the osteopathic profession. <laughs> Most ironically, of course. <coughs> Following this friendly occasion, I had the privilege of attending a CTF intermediate and advanced courses in the United States. And the participants' enthusiasm was again without limit. At that time, the CTF board members called me into a private meeting to ask why I was always willing to travel so far for their courses. They seemed a little suspicious, actually. <laughs> Fortunately, I was able to answer with great conviction that thanks to all of them, I had found the approach to healing I had always dreamed of. They also asked about the status of osteopathy in Belgium and I replied that I was, it was gaining recognition, but still deserved to be much more widely known. So I pledged to do everything I could to promote osteopathy in Belgium and in Europe. Speaking of osteopathy throughout Europe, I would at this point like to express my great gratitude to the faculty of the European School of Osteopathy, which gave me so much during the five years I spent there. This experience came full circle when, in 1986, the principal of the ESO, Tom Bumer, asked me to join his faculty. There, I taught OCF in French to the school part-time students and first had a CPR in English to its full-time students. Five years later, in 1991, I received the distinct honor of becoming an associate member of the SCTF board, representing the Belgian Society of Osteopathy. I immediately wanted, as part of this representation, to share the practice of OCF to those of my Belgian colleagues who didn't want to have the time or financial means to travel to the United States for training. So we board members of the Belgian Society of Osteopathy began organizing courses in Belgium in order to accomplish this. We have the wonderful opportunity of inviting American the host to lead his courses, and John Arakan very graciously accepted our request to come to Brussels and present an introduction to OCF. Around the same time, we also established an osteopathic social clinic with the support of the city of Brussels, which was open two half days per week. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm sorry. The air conditioning was too cool for me. <laughs> so, Around the same time, we also established also, yes, the support, yeah, which was open two half days per week. 
This free clinic was in the poorest district of our Belgian capital, and there we witnessed what true poverty really is. John attended the official inauguration of the clinic, along with Belgian political and clerical authorities. As manager of the clinic, I asked all Belgian heroes to provide free treatment for a half day each month. They agreed, and as a result of this excellent cooperation, osteopathy very quickly gained the appreciation of a much larger segment of the Belgian population. At long last, osteopathy was achieving widespread renown in Belgium. At this point, John Harakal, showing characteristic leadership, proposed designating some of his STTF faculty members to help us organize an STTF basic course in Belgium, as well as a specific course to train Belgian candidates to become lecturers and table trainers. This course was, very logically, entitled Train the Trainers. My group of eager Belgian DOs was supervised in three sessions of two days, each by John Arakal and his faculty members, including Ed Marie, Melissa de Dambel, Viola Freeman, Eric Dolgin, and Jim Jeffs. The participating Belgian candidates were Agnès Engelen, Pierre Duby, Claude Hannard, Christian de Bramander, Luc Lecoq, and myself. We all completed the session successfully, and then very shortly afterwards became board members of the SCTL Belgium, <coughs> which was created in 1995. Not long after that, Tom De Lille and Danny de Bouver also joined the board as vice president and secretary to complete this excellent team of friends. As president of the SCTL Belgium, I became director of the basic courses, which we offer every year with the generous help of Ed Marie, Melissian Titanbel, Edgar Miller, Herbert Miller, Michael Burano, Kenneth Graham, Dan Moore, and Sue Turner, DO from the UK. So in total, we trained more than 500 DOs. We later organized advanced courses <coughs> with the help and participation of Douglas Vick, Rachel Brooks, Miriam Mills, Louis Hasbrook, Stephen Hagopian, Andy Goldman, Kenneth Graham, and again the Millers, that famous duo of Herb and Head, appropriately called the cousins, even if they don't happen to be biologically related. <laughs> I would like just for relaxing show you some uh, oops, oh, no, that's too far. I'm sorry. Uh -oh. This is, you know, probably, this is a famous crown plastic in Brussels. Uh, this is the atomium. This is a symbol of the iron. And so you see the nine balls. That's a very good one, please. This is Bruges. Many uh, of your colleagues have appreciated the localization of the course. Again, Bruges, very quiet place, full of flowers. Ostend, <coughs> you remember, Michael? This is the uh, seaside of Belgium, in front of the UK. Now here, some of you remember probably, with the famous citadel, Antwerp, Miriam, you remember? And Ghent, a very nice city with a very historical hour. So, the OCA. I have been a faithful member of the OCA since 1982, and as such, have attended numerous trainer conferences to, throughout the United States. At our conference nine years ago in Tucson, Arizona, which took place during the transition between Eric Dolchins and Mark Rosen, presidencies, Mark approached our group of international participants, which included my colleague and fellow Belgian DO, Marie Blanche Sioni, and asked us to vote to designate a representative to serve as an official contact with the board in behalf of the international DO community. Since after a period of several moments, no one else volunteered his or her candidacy, I did so and thereby won this really uncontested election by quite a landslide. 
<laughs> I have to need thank my colleagues for this report that they as at that point I begin the incredible experience of discovering what the Cradle Academy really is. As an international board member, I've gained a deep awareness of the Academy's admirable complexity, and even more strictly, with the generous availability of the Academy's board members. Three times a year, in June, October, and March, and this for the past nine years, I have attended all board meetings under the presidencies of Mark Rosen, Ben Friedman, David Musgrave, Zina Pelke, and now Dan Shannon. Perhaps you know that when I first joined the board in, 19, in 2007, sorry, associate board members, so one MD, one DDS, and one international DO, were non-voting members. As to me, this didn't seem particularly productive. I sought to convince the rest of the board with the help of Mark Rosen as co-chair of the International Subcommittee to update OCA policy and allow associate members to become real voting members. <coughs> Following this came the historic decision to change the name of the Cranial Academy, CA, to the Osteopathic Cranial Academy, OCA. It's also quite interesting to note that the letters OCA were in fact our group's initials following its inception in 1948, though at that time, the A stood for association rather than academy. I have only one disappointing memory from all my years of membership in the Ukrainian Academy. In the 90s, and after I had been in practice for more than 10 years, I was denied participation in the Ukrainian Academy's proficiency exam, as this is strictly reserved for American DOs. However, this incident was also the catalyst that five years ago led me along with two of my finest friends, Maurice Ben Soussan, who was president at that time of ZIAMOC, and Dr. Jordet, who succeeded Maurice as president, to organize an international exam of proficiency that was equal in difficulty to the American exam. A significant percentage of international member MDDOs and NPDOs have taken the examination since then, meaning that from, from among approximately 100 international members representing 17 different countries and 10 recognized affiliate societies, 20 have passed the exam and are officially recognized by the OCA. For the sake of comparison, the number of American OCA members who have attempted the exam is only 130 out of 800 members. I'd just like to remind everyone here that to be a faculty or board member of the OCA, one must have this certificate of proficiency. Please consider taking the exam in the future, as every one of you here is certainly capable of passing it, and we are always looking for fresh new board members. It's also important to note that a few years ago, Ukrainian Academy membership rules for international NPDOs had become very strict, in that all potential members were required to belong to a national osteopathic association or official affiliated registry. Prior to that, however, such restrictions did not exist so we ended up with a mix of members, some possessing official and or national recognitions, and some with none. In response to this, we instituted two different member categories, one for DOs who belonged to a recognized affiliate society, RAS, and the other, the other for DOs affectionately referred to as a grandfather who did not. This was still too inconsistent, however, and the board wanted to find a better solution. So we updated OCA membership policies again last year. Our two principal requirements now are a very solid professional background and attendance at a minimum of three trainer conferences. An outstanding example of the beneficial effects of these policy changes is Itsuji Yamamoto, the most faithful DO from Japan, who only became eligible for OCA membership after these updates. Of course, we hope that Japan will soon offer 
formal recognition of the osteopathic profession, but until that time, we must have a means of welcoming deserving members for whom national recognition is not yet possible. In addition, in addition to my life person, Thank you for the applause. If they take the deck <laughs> to clean my nose. Thank you. In addition for, to my life, life's pursuit of osteopathy, I have also, since the age of 20, worked as a freelance journalist for several publications. My most extensive collaboration has been with Parents Magazine, which, as you may know, is the most read magazine in physicians' waiting rooms. I've written around 40 articles for Parents Magazine explaining osteopathic topics in language accessible to the layperson. And these pieces are still available on my website, osteoland.be. Because of these journalistic experiences, I was quite delighted to learn that William Garner Sutherland was working as a journalist when he first met and interviewed Dr. Eddie Steele. Sutherland was extremely impressed with Dr. Steele's methods and reported very, very enthusiastically on his revolutionary approach to medicine. He then, as a result of this contact, completed his MDO degree a very short time after that under the tutelage of Dr. Steele. What followed were Dr. Sutherland's famous exploded skull discoveries, which, thanks perhaps to his prior experience as a journalist, he recorded with great precision. Indeed, Dr. Sutherland established the perfect principles for cranial osteopathy that became the foundation of modern OCF, and we are forever indebted to his brilliant and groundbreaking work. Now let's turn to the current application of both Dr. Stills and Dr. Sutherland's discoveries. Last year, in Naples, Florida, Mark Rosen gave an excellent presentation on some of Dr. Stills and Dr. Sutherland's original ideas and intentions. Through these topics, which have also been addressed during past conferences by Ron Baker and Jim Jellos, we are reminded of the importance of stillness and the food drugs. Beginning osteopaths almost never feel these sensations immediately, but they must have faith that the sensations do indeed exist, and that they too will feel them one day. It is the responsibility of more experienced DOs to teach newer practitioners to first sense and then trust these feelings, and we strive to do this with compassion and love. To love is indeed to share and we must guide our students to understand what they cannot yet consistently feel. The victory comes when they do finally and suddenly feel and discover what it is. Those sensations will flee if a newer practitioner becomes tired or less attentive. This is not a disaster, of course, but just another step forward in the evolution of an individual osteopath's abilities of palpation. We always dream of finding more success in our own palpation and also possess a strong desire to help our new co newer colleagues constantly dig deeper. As we often say, the O stands for dig on. With this in mind, I am always looking forward to our next OCA meetings where each time we discover and discuss explanations <coughs> that satisfy our need to continually progress. Turning to the topic of research, some MDs, MD groups have advised us that further scientific experiments would enhance the credibility of our methods. The problem is, however, that so-called so EBM must in general be researched based on isolated criteria rather than the holistic state of health. Therefore, it's practically impossible to quantify and record the benefits of, uh, using, of OCF using this model. <laughs> As Jim Gerald says, health is present when all four crumbs are synchronous. That's to say, it's only one when, look, when one looks at bodily health holistically and not system by system that one perceives the astonishing results <laughs> produced by osteopathy. We could also mention that only about 30 persons of the practices upon, relied upon by allopathic practitioners 
are based on EBM. So should we suggest in return that they stop using the other 30 persons? Despite this lack of EBM, I am most privileged to have received osteopathic treatments from numerous experts during my visit to the United States. These stars of our profession have included Louis Asbrook, Paul Lee, Herbert Miller, Ed Lally, Edgar Miller, Melissant Tandel, Richard Freely, David Musgrave, Melvin Friedman, and of course, Maurice Ben Sousa. Furthermore, during our lab sessions, I have discovered, along with many of you, a number of wonderfully different approaches. Some are very light and soft, and others heavier and more assertive. <coughs> but the results are remarkably successful. We all have different approaches, but what we always have in common is our great respect for the body's responses, the tissue's reactions, the palpations of the LCR fluctuations, and finally the goal of attaining synchronicity and stillness. We describe this as unity within diversity. And this is one of the elements that keep our profession dynamic and strong. As we all certainly acknowledge, our foremost duty is to help our patients, and to do this we must wait patiently for their tissues' responses and always offer the highest quality of care. This is not necessarily in terms of the time spent working on patients, but rather the quality of the treatments we provide. I've met many EDOs, MD, sorry, I've met many MDs who are very skeptical about osteopathy, saying that our results are merely placebo action, and that the only value in more manual and friendly contact with patients is to give an impression of good care. It's encouraging to note, however, that a number of these MDs have reversed their dismissive opinions after personally undergoing osteopathy treatments. I can never offer enough, uh, offer enough gratitude for the perspicacity of those of my colleagues who have so tactfully helped me toward greater understanding and have so discreetly guided me in changing the positions of, for example, my fingers, feet, or head. Their guidance has permitted me to understand and absorb even more quickly what they were so generously explaining and providing. I have always encountered a very high level of teaching within our profession noting that it is consistently both attentive and supportive. For example, when we are practicing in labs, it's most encouraging to see that participants are offered relevant and sincere compliments, as these serve to increase both their consciousness of and pleasure in their progress. An excellent proponent of this dynamic was our beloved Anne Wales, who joined us at the 70th International Congress in Belgium and with whom I attended many STTF board meetings. She was always so kind and generous with her explanations, which were without exception extremely rich and helpful. I'd also like to mention here Dr. Rachel Brooks and Dr. Miriam Mills, who as MDs are two inspiring examples of the transition to osteopathic medicine. They are rightfully very proud of their new pathway, and are always willing to enthusiastically share their latest discoveries. Thanks again, dear Miriam and dear Rachel. And in final homage, I would like to thank most affectionately my mentors, Dr. Ennale and Dr. Anthony Schiller. Since the very beginning of our relationship with the US osteopathic community, I have always been available to advise and protect our small group of little Belgians, ours has been a true histoire d'amour. That's a real love story. Conclusion. Both American physician DOs, as well as international physician and non-physician DOs, find wonderful solidarity in the fact that we proudly embrace, champion, and utilize the principles of genuine osteopathy. Indeed, those of you assembled here today practice osteopathic medicine in its purest form, and you are thereby ensuring that the benefits of traditional osteopathy will exist for future generations. In Belgium, we have a motto, Union fait la force, which means unity creates strength. This clearly describes the current state of the international osteopathic community and also reinforces the fact that DOs worldwide 
must continue collaborating in order to promote and uphold osteopathic principles. We must, in addition, remain aware that our international diversity is a vital element of our strength. Also, we all have different approaches, backgrounds, qualifications, and recognitions. We remain united by our skills, experiences, and ideals. As a final reflection, I would like to express once again my deepest gratitude to our leaders and mentors. My life changes forever once I dedicated my life to honoring and practicing thy teachings. I truly became a new person upon discovering the breath of life which I personally also think of as a breath of love. This is due first to the nature of our work, which is to lovingly activate the healing forces that exist within every human body. It's also certainly due, however, to the extraordinary amount of love, guidance, and support I have experienced within this profession, and in particular from the group of truly exceptional healers who are present here today. Thank you so very much for listening to my personal experience of the journey of the International Deal today and also most importantly for having accepted as international practitioners into this wonderful group of professionals and friends. One of my greatest joys is being an international member of the Osteopathic Kremlin Academy. And it's always an immense privilege to gather together with you all. A continued relationship between the OCA and the international DO community is extremely important and I therefore pledge to stay on as an OCA board member until another international non-fiction DO steps in to take my place. Again, I heartily thank you for your attention today and for the very great honor of presenting this year's Southern Memorial Lecture. Merci mille fois, let's thank you a thousand times and goodbye until we meet again. Je n'ai rien compris.